Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest in our series of webinars with our legal partner, NL Goodbody. The feedback from members for this series has been really positive. We are really thankful to NL Goodbody for their time and expertise, and we're glad that we can squeeze just one more in before the summer break. For anyone who does want to catch up on previous webinars in the series with NL Goodbody, they are available on our website charteredaccountants.ie forward slash Ulster. So today's webinar, we have Kieran McCory and Ellie McMaster, and they're taking a look at how businesses and organizations should handle challenges to contracts. We'll be looking at some key areas, which will include current market trends and key issues affecting contracts to supply, contract termination, including force majeure clauses, frustration and illegality, methods of enforcing a contract covering injunctive proceedings, and key things to consider whenever you're negotiating contract. By way of introduction, Kieran is a senior associate in ANL Good Bodies Litigation Department. He specialises in commercial disputes and leads that particular area in the Belfast office. As well as general commercial disputes, Kieran specialises in corporate and property disputes. He joined NL Good Body towards the end of last year, and throughout his career, he has developed a broad range of expertise in the world of disputes. Ellie is a paralegal and future trainee in NL Good Body's litigation department, working alongside Kieran. Ellie joined the firm earlier in the year after completing her master's in international commercial law and alternative dispute resolution, and will begin her training contract with the firm later this year. For those that are familiar with this series, um, you know that we are open for questions and answers at the end. So please feel free to put your questions um, to, for the presenters into the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. The Q&A is now open, so feel free to get typing. I would, however, ask that you keep your questions general. Kieran and Ellie, as you appreciate, cannot answer specific legal queries during a webinar, but we will be able to provide contact details after if there is something specific that you would like a little bit more detail on. So our session today is about 45 minutes with questions afterwards. We have quite a lot to get through, so let's get started. So I would like to welcome Kieran and Ellie. Thanks, Emma, and um, thank you to the Chartered Accountants and also Society for having us here to, uh, to with, with everyone today. Uh, thank you uh, to, to those who are, are watching and um, for those watching live as well um, and, and for in the future availing of the, of the uh, recording. Um, we're going to talk to you today about contracts and as we are litigators, um, as is in our nature, we tend to focus on what happens when things go wrong. Um, so global supply chains uh, recently have experienced turmoil over the last two years in the face of the global pandemic, Brexit, and now most recently the war on European soil. With prices soaring and supply chains disrupted by the impact of these events, many businesses find themselves struggling to supply the demand of their customers. This is posing a real commercial threat to the viability of their contracts. While they're struggling to meet uh, demand due to labour deficiencies or experiencing reduced profit margins, as a result of rising fuel and material costs. In many cases, it may no longer actually be commercially viable to continue with contracts to supply. As a result of these unprecedented circumstances, businesses are turning towards their contracts now to understand um, their, their position and, and, and where they stand. However, if the contract does not allow for early termination, a party may risk being in breach of contract or, and could face legal proceedings should they cease to supply or fail to meet their end of the bargain. This has left the atmosphere in trades ripe for disputes. So today we're going to discuss the current market trends and some of the issues that businesses are currently facing. We're also going to provide an overview of contractual termination and the remedies for breach of contract. And finally, we will sum up with our key takeaways to consider when entering into um, or dealing with contracts. So a bit of a market review just to kick off. The supply chain crisis was originally triggered by the pandemic. However, it has been escalated even further by the conflict in Ukraine. Some of the key issues that businesses are currently facing would include the rise in raw material costs, uh, which is driving up prices to exorbitant levels. We have all ourselves seen in our daily lives the rise in oil and fuel prices. Uh, during COVID, uh, oil prices reached as low as $40 per barrel. However, as of May of this year, the instability of the, middle, of the, the um, 
the substantial upshift in demand, the war and also the instability in the Middle East has caused the price to uh, reach around $113 per barrel. So these figures, of course, continue to fluctuate, fluctuate, but that's an absolutely massive increase. There's also been a rise in the cost of shipping. The sea carries more than 80% of the world's traded goods, and the cost of shipping have heightened massively in the past year. A container from China increased from an average of $2,500 uh, to a peak of approximately $15,000 in February of this year. Closer to home, the Northern Ireland Protocol has caused and is continuing to cause disruption uh, to trade pending the proposed legislative changes of the UK government. These changes include the introduction of green and red lanes to separate these, those goods that were staying in Northern Ireland from the goods moving through Northern Ireland to the Republic of Ireland and the EU. The aim of this is to remove the extensive checks and paperwork requirements for those goods remaining in Northern Ireland. The current uncertainty around these changes, however, poses the risk of further disruption to supply chains moving in and out of Northern Ireland. And the sooner all of that gets resolved, the better. The Guardian has recently commented on the negative impact of Brexit on the UK's trade with the European Union. Recent data shows that exports to the EU declined by almost 14% in 2021. The return of a customs border between the EU and Great Britain means that there is now paperwork required for almost every product shipping between the two markets, and checks are therefore required on thousands of goods daily. This increased red tape has removed the dynamic nature of the UK's trade with the EU and imposed additional stress on local um, supply chains. Internationally, although Russia and Ukraine are accounted uh, or only accounted for approximately 4% of global GDP in 2021, the interconnectedness of the global supply chains has caused this the conflict, um, caused by this, this conflict have rippling effects on the industrial world. It has created buyers in the market, disrupting the movement of commodities like auto parts, oil, and grain. And according to a recent Dun & Bradstreet report, more than 600,000 businesses worldwide rely on Russian and Ukrainian uh, suppliers. So what's in the news? We'll start with excessive demand. Global supply chains are under significant pressure following the pandemic. And in light of the war in Ukraine, there is a significant imbalance in demand and supply levels across all industries. The significant disruption has had a serious impact on many businesses. One example, which we've all seen in the news recently, is, is Revlon, the cosmetics brand, who filed for bankruptcy on the 16th of June due to supply chain disruptions driving up the cost of raw materials for its products. In the court filing, the company said that supply chain disruptions had prompted intense competition for the ingredients used in its cosmetics, and supplier payments, inflation, and labor shortages all also contributed to their financial crisis. Another big story in the news is the flight cancellations. The news of airlines cancelling hundreds of flights has taken over our screens over the last few weeks, causing many holidaymakers much dreaded uncertainty as they look forward to finally being able to travel once again post-pandemic. It is reported that the lack of staff is one of the primary reasons behind the recent flight cancellations, and as a result, airlines have been unable to perform the obligations. And as a result, airlines have been unable. Uh, and as a result, airlines have been unable to perform their obligations that they have under their contracts with passengers and on a larger scale in relation to their arrangements with airports themselves. As a result of this, airlines have had to reacquaint themselves with their contracts and options available to them in the event of breaching their contractual obligations. And now in particular, as many travelers are seeking compensation for their losses. Another big piece in the news is, um, is, is food supplies. Global food supplies have been hit hard by the effects of the war. And as a result, we have seen increased food prices around the world. Russia and Ukraine are big exporters of grains such as corn, barley and wheat, as well as fertilizer, um, which is causing food prices to skyrocket as these supplies cannot be exported due to the war. And expected 24 million tons of wheat sown last year was expected to be shipped out of Ukraine at the start of this summer. However, according to the Washington Post, this is now expected to be as little as six or seven million tons as a result of the war. Global prices of agricultural commodities have spiked, leaving local farmers feeling the effects of the war on their production. These price increases have made and will continue to make their way from farm to fork as consumers feel the effects of these prices and the cost of living. So all of this has impacted consumer confidence. And due to the market conditions, consumer confidence has fallen to its lowest level since records actually began in 1974. Confidence in personal finances and expectation for the general economy has dropped and the plummet in business confidence is adding to the mounting signs of a looming recession. 
businesses, uh, business expectations suffered the largest monthly decline since the start of the pandemic with manufacturers and services firms experiencing the lowest levels of growth for more than a year. Issues such as prices rising faster than wages, the prospect of strikes and spiraling inflation are all contributing to this problem. So I'm now going to pass you back over to Ali, who's um, going to talk through a case study of one of the industries which has been particularly impacted uh, by the issues discussed. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm just going to talk through one industry that has been majorly affected by the market issues that Kieran has discussed, and that is the car industry. Um, and really, this is down to the microchip crisis. Maybe some of you have experienced this. Um, you've maybe looked to buy a new car in the last couple of years and then been faced with a long wait times. Um, so the chip making crisis really began during the pandemic. As lockdowns were imposed and more and more people were required to work from home, the demand for consumer tech products rose substantially. And simultaneously to this, then the car manufacturing industry were forced to shut down their production um, as car sales were dropping um, due to less people traveling and also the uncertainty caused by the pandemic. As a result, then the chip manufacturers were shifting their energy and resources towards the consumer tech industry, as this is where the demand was increasing and moving their resources away from producing chips for car manufacturers as the demand here was reducing. So once we started to move through the pandemic then and the car industry resumed their production, chip makers were faced with demand from both the consumer tech industry and the car industry and struggled to meet the demand from both, which led to a shortage in supply. This combined then with the war in Ukraine has escalated the supply issues even further. Ukrainian companies Ingus and Kryon account for around half of the world's neon production, which is a critical component for lasers, which are used in chip making. Russia also produces about a third of the world's palladium supply, and this is a rare metal that's used in sensor chips also. So the conflict has obviously then restricted the supply even further, and this has escalated the crisis um, and pushed up the prices. In addition, Ukraine also has a thriving car parts industry, and the semiconductor shortage has been crippling the industry already, and with the war, it's causing further disruption, and it's expected to lower global output by around 1.5 million units. So why is this an issue then? Well, within this industry, a delay in a single component can either hold up or shut down production entirely, which causes massive issues for the supply chain. As a result, then, the production of new cars has reduced substantially since pre-pandemic levels, which has left a shortage and pushed the prices of used cars up. According to latest figures from AutoTrader, May 2022 was the 26th consecutive month of price growth in used cars with the average used car price now around £3,400 more than it was last year. The average increase across all makes and models has been more than 28% since May 2021. These figures are really quite remarkable, and combined with the rising fuel costs that we're all experiencing at the moment, it's making motoring substantially um, more expensive and unsustainable for con consumers, obviously, but also businesses who rely on vehicles for the carrying out of their businesses. So as a result of this, then, the crisis within um, car manufacturing has called for many car manufacturers to redesign their cars to have um, fewer high-tech components. And this is in an attempt to reduce the excessive demand on chips. And it really does show the extent that companies within this industry are having to go to to find a solution to this issue. It also highlights that it isn't just a short-term issue and there is a lot of uncertainty around how long this crisis will continue because redevelopment isn't a quick fix and it will require significant R&D investment from many car manufacturers in order to redevelop their technology and lower their dependency on these components. So the issues that we've discussed and in particular this case study on this industry really demonstrates the difficulties that businesses are facing at the moment. And many businesses will be in long-term supply contracts that are no longer commercially viable due to the market conditions and the issues we've discussed, um, particularly if these contracts were negotiated pre-pandemic. In such cases, it may be possible to renegotiate with your counterparty, revise the terms and, and seek to find a relatively quick um, and easy resolution. However, this, of course, will not always be the case. And in such circumstances, the businesses may be looking towards their contracts to evaluate whether termination is viable and the potential risks of doing so. So I will now pass back to Kieran, who's going to talk through challenging a contract and the remedies available if a contract is breached or challenged. Thanks, Ali. So we're now going to move on yeah, to terminating the contract, and I will start with termination clauses. Many contracts are governed by terms and conditions which can be particularly onerous and one-sided if not carefully negotiated or considered. 
Standard terms and conditions should include termination clauses, which allow the parties to terminate in, uh, the contract in particular circumstances. Typical, typical examples would be where a material breach has been committed by a party, where a party is in financial difficulty, for example, administration, liquidation, winding up or the appointment of a receiver, where a party suspends or ceases to carry out all or carry on all or a substantial part of its business, or where there has been a financial deterioration of a party which affects its ability to perform the contract. When assessing your legal rights and obligations in the face of supply chain disruption, start by looking at the clauses of the contract and whether there is a termination clause which relates to the issue you're facing. There are a few points to consider in the first instance. Is time of the essence in the contract? If so, a delay could potentially be considered grounds to terminate. Is there a need to decide on termination relatively quickly? If the innocent party does not terminate promptly, it could risk affirming the breach and lose the right to terminate. As businesses seek to preserve their working relationships and are compelled to compromise with other businesses in the supply chain in order to resolve delays, it is important to understand whether there are any actions which may inadvertently legitimize the breach or vary the contract. It's also important to understand whether the contract specifies termination procedure, so often which includes stages for dispute resolution. Failure to adhere to such contractual procedures could pose a further breach um, of contract or could result in cost ramifications should a party rush to litigation. We're now going to get into technical territory and I'm going to talk to you about force majeure, so I hope everyone is still with us so far. Force majeure clause enables one or both parties to be excused from their contractual obligations following the occurrence of event outside of the party's control. In such circumstances, that party may not be liable for a breach of contract. The events included within a force majeure clause are subject to agreement between the parties, but generally they can include, um, for example, an act of God, which is a flood, drought, earthquake, or other natural disaster, epidemic or pandemic, terrorist attack or war, imposition of sanctions, nuclear or chemical contamination, industrial action, or an interruption of utility service. The key test to be applied for, with force majeure is foreseeability. It is often interpreted narrowly by the courts. This has been particularly difficult during the pandemic as continuous lockdowns raised questions around foreseeability when repeated lockdowns became the norm and businesses uh, had to be pre remain prepared at all times. The COVID-19 pandemic and the current war in Ukraine certainly raised the question of whether force majeure clauses can be relied upon if a contract is affected by such events. In the case of Dwyer, UK Franchising Limited v Fred Bar Limited in 2021, the High Court was tasked with first deciding whether an enforced period of self-isolation was sufficient to trigger a force majeure clause in a franchise agreement. The claim was brought by, uh, by the UK franchisor of the drain doctor, plumbing and drainage business. The defendant <clears throat> was advised to self-isolate for 12 weeks at the beginning of the pandemic as his son was vulnerable. The defendant emailed the franchisor to advise that there had been a drop in demand and due to his need to self-isolate, he requests a suspension of the agreement under the force majeure conditions. The franchise were refused. The relevant force majeure clause was unusual as it read that the agreement would be suspended if either party was prevented or hindered from complying with their obligations by any cause which the franchise or designates as force majeure. The court therefore considered the principles from the landmark case of Braganza VBP Shipping Limited when considering whether the franchise or had breached the agreement by failing to treat self-isolation as a force majeure event. The court held the that, that, that the power to call a force majeure, majeure event had to be exercised honestly, in good faith, and genuinely. Accordingly, in this case, the franchisor had breached his duty. Another interesting case is out of the European Professional Club, Club Rugby, um, or EPCR, via RDI Television in 2022. In that case, the EPCR postponed all upcoming games following the World Health Organization's um, announcement that COVID-19 was a global pandemic. This decision resulted in the defendant RDA, who was the broadcaster, engaged in the media rights agreement to terminate that agreement. EPCR claimed that this was unlawful, and the relevant clause in that agreement defined force majeure events as any circumstances beyond the reasonable control of a party affecting the performance of that party of its, obliga of its obligations under this agreement. Epidemic was expressly referred to in the definition of force majeure in the agreement, and the court was satisfied that pandemic was included within this context. In addressing how exactly to interpret the clause, the judge highlighted that, highlighted that the departure 
point in most cases would be the language used by the parties because the parties have the control over the language they use in a contract and the parties have been specifically focusing on the issue covered by the disputed clause or clauses when agreeing the wording of that provision. The court highlighted that, there, that where there's an ambiguous wording in an agreement, the court is entitled to prefer the construction which is consistent with business and commercial common sense. This is, of course, to be determined subjectively. The question that will be asked is what would be deemed reasonable by those in the same position? In this case, the court concluded that the EPCR's argument was commercially absurd and the wording of the force majeure clause is not constru construed in a way as to deprive the parties of recourse when both parties are affected by the force majeure event. Almost three years into the pandemic, the force majeure defence has become even more nuanced when labelling a pandemic with a force majeure, with an force majeure clause and careful wording should be included to not only acknowledge the existence of a pandemic, but also to specifically narrow the terms of the contract to take into account any government re regulations that can excuse a party from fulfilling their obligations under the contract. The war in Ukraine and the imposition of Russian sanctions has also raised, raises, raised questions around the applicability of force majeure clauses. The Ukrainian, the, war in, uh, the Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce and Industry um, issued a, a, a statement on 30th of March 2022 stating that the military aggression of the Russian Federation against Ukraine, which led to the imposition of martial law, has evidenced forced majeure circumstances. Now, although this statement carries questionable weight as it is very much politically motivated, it does act as a reminder to remain alert to the contractual issues that may arise when the armed conflict in Ukraine and related sanctions disrupt business operations and, contra and, and contractual commitments. Some questions to ask when considering the applicability of these force majeure clauses would be, what impact, if any, did the conflict or sanction have on the performance? Should the parties have anticipated such challenges? Is the conflict being used as an excuse for an existing, ex an existing inability to perform, which would have resulted in a, in a breach regardless of the conflict? And did the party seeking in to excuse performance take reasonable steps to limit the impact of the force majeure event? These and other factors could make or break a defense. So a couple of key points to note, um, force majeure clauses can be complex and they are often disputed. Um, they are not implied as a matter of law. And if you wish to avail of any protection from a force majeure clause, you must draft a specific clause to cover those circumstances that you are concerned about. These have been become particularly uh, common recently following the pandemic. There's no established uh, meaning or of, of force majeure as a matter of law. The context will depend on the words used in the actual contract. And this is why using broad and ambiguous wording can pose difficulties. And is often it is often important to choose your wording carefully. The force majeure event must not have been foreseeable. With COVID-19 being prevalent for over two years, it is unclear whether parties can argue that the pandemic continues to be deemed as unforeseeable, considering that we now have adjusted to the new normal and parties have adjusted to the pandemic-related issues. Whilst COVID-19 um, was held to fall within the scope of force majeure under the epidemic um, clause in the EPCR dispute, there is, no, there is no guarantee that this will always be the case and it will inevitably fall to the interpretation of the relevant clauses. If the clause allows for one party to interpret and decide what constitutes a force majeure event, bear in mind the obligations of the, by the Braganza case, which requires the obligation to be exercised honestly, um, in good faith and genuinely. If you'll indulge me, we will um, get in, into even more technical territory and we're now going to talk about frustration. After force majeure clauses, the next port of call is the common law doctrine of frustration under which a contract may be terminated. This is where the contract has become impossible to perform or the obligation is radically different to that when the parties entered into the agreement. In such cases, the parties may be discharged from their contractual obligations following an event which, it, which makes it physically, legally or commercially impossible to perform them. Frustration is a difficult argument to make and only provides a means of termination in exceptional circumstances. A few examples would be destruction of the subject matter of the contract, so by, far, by fire or, or other cause, unavailability of the subject matter, a legislative change which makes performance of the contract illegal, and I'm going to touch upon illegality again shortly, the cancellation of an ex expected event or unexpected delay in, the, in its performance due to an unexpected event or a change of circumstances.
In relation to unexpected delay, the frustrated contract delay must be abnormal so that it falls outside the party, uh, what the parties could have contemplated at the time of, of contracting. That's the Lima case in 1982. Frustration is also possible, possible when the position or obligation is radically different to what was anticipated at the outset. We have the shipping case to Sakharov, Levy, Nobley, Thorl in 1962. In that case, it was established that imposing the burden on the party, which is radically different to what was contemplated at the time of contracting, was regarded as frustration of the contractual obligations, even though technically in that case, performance was not actually impossible. Instead of temporarily stopping a contract like force majeure usually does, frustration discharges a, contact, a contract. If a sufficiently material event strikes at the heart of the contract, then it cannot be performed. We've identified a number of helpful cases then to hopefully provide some useful context, useful context on frustration. The first is the case of Bank of New York Mellon International Limited v. Cine UK Limited from uh, 2021. In that case, the High Court granted summary judgment to the landlords of commercial properties, which required their tenants to pay rent despite the extensive restrictions imposed by the government in response to the pandemic. The tenants claimed that their leases had been temporarily frustrated because either their premises were forced to close or because it would be commercially unfeasible for them to open. The court rejected the claim of temporary frustration. A contract is either frustrated in its entirety or it is not. The effect of frustration is to end the contract so it, it cannot be temporarily frustrated and then revived at a later stage. The court accepted the forced, mature, uh, or sorry, the forced closure of a premises as a result of a supervening event, particularly when uh, the leases permit only certain uses that have become impossible, could in principle result in, in frustration. However, whilst the parties in this case could not have predicted a global pandemic, the court did decide that the leases had not been frustrated. This was largely due to the length of the, of the leases, because in this particular scenario, even the closure of 18 months had still left the tenants um, with the majority of the benefit of the leases as a whole. This next case is the case of Wilmington Trust SP Services Dublin Limited v Spice Jet Limited uh, again in 2021. In this case, the plaintiff brought a claim for unpaid rent and dollar amounts due to under the leases of three Boeing aircraft by Spice Jet Limited. These leases were dry leases, which means that the lessee, in this case Spice Jet Limited, assumed all the risk and responsibility in operating and maintaining the, the aircraft for a term of 10 years. You might recall from the, the, the news, the, the field crash that occurred that year. As a result of the pandemic, the use of the first aircraft was significantly reduced and the remaining two had to be grounded following the crash. SpiceJet argued that the restrictions of its use in the, of the aircraft resulted in the contract being, being frustrated. In principle, the court did agree that these circumstances could give rise to the frustration of a contract. However, the court held that the intervening events did not render the contract radically different from what had been envisaged at the outset. SpiceJet had assumed the entire commercial risk of operating the aircraft, which included the risk of the aircraft potentially being grounded. The court also considered the length of the lease again and stated that an operational suspension for roughly 10% of the overall lease term did not constitute frustration. And then moving on to our last example, the contract merely becoming more difficult to perform is not sufficient uh, in a claim for frustration. Brexit therefore is not held to be a frustrating event as evidenced by the case of Canary Wharf BP4 T1 Limited and others against the European Medicines Agency or, or EMA in 2019. In EMA's defence, they essentially argued that the UK's withdrawal from the EU would trigger various legal changes relating to its legal, legal capacity to continue with its lease, which could cause the lease to be frustrated. The judge found that while the EMA's privileges and immunities under the EU treaties would be materially and adversely affected by Brexit, its capacity to deal with real property in a non-EU country and hence to use or dispose of the premises and to pay rent under the lease would remain. Therefore, the frustration argument failed. This case highlights that it is very difficult to argue a contract has been frustrated when you can't perform the obligations. In particular, it is not sufficient if the unforeseen event makes the contract more expensive or less convenient to perform. The event must be fundamental to the terms of the contract. So we mentioned frustration if a, if a contract becomes illegal. This would arguably be the case for many companies under the imposed Russian sanctions. A good example is Russia being barred from the SWIFT global payment system, which could make it impossible to complete necessary financial obligations within the terms of the contract. The case law shows that the court will take a focused approach and examine the terms of the contract and the surrounding circumstances, rather than simply looking at the severity of, of the event that is alleged to have frustrated it. Parties 
should ensure that the contract clearly allocates the responsibility and risk between the parties in the case of unexpected events. And bear in mind the term of the contract. Whilst a longer term can provide stability and often pricing benefits, it may be harder to argue that a longer contract has been frustrated by a supervening event, as evidenced by the cases we've just gone through there. Frustration will only apply on rare occasions and contracting parties should not rely on it as an automatic remedy should an unexpected event take place, even one as devastating as a global pandemic. Whilst the courts have recognized frustration, they have consistently affirmed that the threshold um, for, for proving it remains high. I'm just going to meet, briefly go into illegality in a bit more detail. So um, the concept of illegality um, allows parties to be discharged from a contract if the performance of such becomes illegal by law. This was a particular issue, obviously, that we saw during the COVID pandemic when local governments enacted emergency legislation to control the waves of the pandemic, which included the closing of retail, hospitality and other commercial premises. In such cases, the performance of some contracts were deemed to be contrary to public policy and termination was therefore permitted in some cases. The imposition of sanctions are also relevant here. If performing a contract results in an illegal activity, for example, a breach of sanctions, sanctions legislation, then this would be a potential defence to a claim from a counterparty for breach of contract, assuming, of course, that the party is subject to the UK sanctions requirements and the contract is subject to the applicable law. I now pass you back um, over to Ellie, uh, who's going to talk you through enforcing a contract and the potential remedies a party may avail of in the event of a breach of contract. Thanks, Kieran. So um, if a party has breached a term of a contract, then there are a number of options available. Um, so the first principal remedy really for this would be damages, and these are awarded to compensate um, the injured party for its loss. So the damages should generally place the injured party in the position that it would have been in had the breach not occurred. Um, damages are subject to the principles of remoteness, causation and mitigation, and it must be considered firstly whether what happened is ordinary in the course um, in the circumstances. And secondly, whether actual knowledge of the special circumstances out of the ordinary course of things were communicated to the defendant or known by the parties. So a few points to note then in relation to damages. Well, firstly, you must consider when the breach occurred, as this will be the date used for the assessment of damages. It's also important to consider the financial loss caused by the breach of contract. Um, this will include the costs and liabilities incurred by the injured party to a third party and also any profits which may have been lost by the injured party as a result of the breach. A key question then is whether the breach has caused the loss and the plaintiff must be able to legally prove that the breach of contract resulted in the loss. And if this test cannot be satisfied, regardless of the breach of contract, damages will not be awarded. The loss must be in the reasonable contemplation of the parties at the time that the contract was made. So in other words, the loss must flow directly and naturally from the breach um, or have been reasonably foreseeable. The damage can therefore not be too remote. It is also important to note that a party must mitigate their loss in order to claim damages. So this means that the injured party must take reasonable steps to avoid or reduce its loss. So for example, if a supplier fails to deliver goods, the buyer will need to take all reasonable steps to find an alternative supplier at the best price. So if that buyer buys replacement goods from another seller at a much higher price without investigating all of the options, then this would be um, likely deemed inadequate mitigation of loss. And in such circumstances, the damages awarded will be limited to what would be deemed reasonable and um, based on evidence. There are also um, two other potential remedies when faced with breach of contract. These are repudiation and rescission. Now, I don't want to bore you too much with these as they aren't the most interesting of topics, but they are good to highlight um, nonetheless. And we are, of course, happy to discuss these with you in further detail if you would like. So just as a general overview, then repudiation of a contract occurs where one party renounces their obligations under a contract as they are unwilling or unable to perform those obligations. In such cases, the innocent party will be given a choice of how to proceed. Um, they can either continue with the contract or accept the repudiation and elect to terminate the agreement. In relation to rescission then, this remedy allows for the contract to be set aside following a breach. And this remedy really aims to place the parties in the position that they would have been in had the contract never existed. So potential grounds for this remedy would include misrepresentation, duress and undue influence, mistake and breaches of fiduciary duties. So moving on then to circumstances where damages wouldn't be appropriate, um, a business may require performance of the obligations instead, and in such circumstances, injunctive proceedings could be a helpful remedy. 
Generally, injunctive proceedings involve an order of the court um, which require a party either to do a specific a specific act and um, so that would be a mandatory injunction or to refrain from doing a specified act and that would be a prohibitory injunction. A mandatory injunction then is an order which requires a person um, to either not to continue to um, with some wrongful omission. So for example, um, if a departing employee of a business leaves with confidential information, you might wish to seek an order from the court which would require them to deliver the wrongly um, retained company property. Um, mandatory injunctions can also require a person to undo the consequences of a wrongful act. So, for example, you could seek an order to require a person to knock down an unlawfully built house. If a party is defaulting in their contract contractual obligations, injunctive relief may offer a means of compelling them to perform those obligations. And this would be particularly helpful where damages for breach of contract would not be an appropriate remedy. In such cases, you may look towards specific performance um, as an adequate remedy. So moving on to specific performance then, this is an order from the court which compels a party to perform their contractual obligations. It is a discretionary remedy um, exercised by the court in accordance with equitable principles. This remedy is often associated with contracts for the sale of land and it is less likely to be granted for other types of property such as goods. Um, usually an award of damages would suffice here as the goods can be purchased from elsewhere. However, there are obviously circumstances where this isn't true. So if the item is rare, um, unique or otherwise unavailable, you may be able to avail of specific performance in those circumstances. As a general rule, specific performance can only be granted where firstly, there is a valid um, enforceable contract. And secondly, where damages um, would not be an adequate remedy. Specific performance is generally not available in respect of negative obligations or contractual obligations which require constant um, supervision to perform. But the key point really to remember with specific performance is it is an exceptional remedy and it's only available where damages wouldn't be adequate. The court will not grant specific performance where performance of the contract um, is impossible. However, if an event has simply made performance of the contract more onerous, the order may be granted um, because it will still be possible to perform that contract. So, for example, um, in light of the, the current issues we've discussed with fuel costs, if a party defaulted on their contractual obligations due to rising fuel prices, the performance of the contract in this case is still possible. It's just more onerous on that party. Um, and so damages may not be adequate in such circumstances and the court may potentially grant specific performance to require that party to perform those obligations. So I will now hand back to Kieran, who's going to wrap up our talk today and discuss some key tips to bear in mind when negotiating or entering into a contract. Thanks, Ali. So, yeah, we thought it would be helpful just to do a brief summary um, of uh, a couple of uh, key takeaways. So, number one, do you have an escape plan? When negotiating or entering into a contract, you may want to ensure that you have a way out or a means of, of, of terminating the contract. Look toward the, 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 if you're already in a contract, look toward the, the relevant termination clauses in your contract and, for example, as well as there is there a force majeure clause. The first thing to consider is how long is left on the contract and, and what are the commercial time pressures. On the flip side, it's a bit of a focus there perhaps on, 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 on exiting as a supplier on the flip side you may want to maintain the contract and are you relying on your suppliers if you're worried about your counterparty looking to exit and you've caught wind of potential supply issues then look at your agreements and and you may need to prepare accordingly it could be time to discuss or, or 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 renegotiate number two record your key dates and notice periods so it is important to diarize the key dates within a contract to include your start and end dates and also any relevant notice periods so often these are missed or forgotten about by businesses you need to ensure that all contracts are documented and the signed copies retained on file or on a database so that they can be accessed quickly and easily. Ensure that you meet the demands of your contract. So in light of the issues discussed in this presentation within the market um, before entering into a contractual arrangement, it is important to ascertain whether you can definitely meet all of the obligations of the contract, um, particularly um, su supply obligations and, and for the entire term of the contract may be wise to allow for flexibility um, in the contract, which can, in the contract which can assist in, in the face of, of, of market pressures. Number four, it's also important to know your market. So be aware of the current issues affecting your industry when negotiating a contract so that you can include the relevant clauses or adapt the clauses to suit your needs as a business. The introduction of more and more force with your clauses and the contracts off the back of the pandemic is a prime example of this. And then finally, 
speak to your lawyers. This isn't a plug. And often when lawyers become involved in a contractual dispute, it is already too late. If you're entering into a con con complex contractual arrangement, do speak to your lawyers and ask them to review the contract before signing. Again, if you're unsure about your exit plan or you're struggling to meet demands, seek advice before taking drastic measures because such measures could result in a breach of contract. So that about wraps us up and we will um, pass back to, to Emma. Um, thank you all very much for watching. Thank you, Kieran and Ellie. Um, we have a quiet bunch on today, so um, not uh, too many questions, but I suppose some of my own reflections um, in terms of, of contracts, it is always looking at that, what is the worst scenario position? And the escape plan really is something that does ring true. Um, as I reflect on the pandemic, there are two words that I weren't particularly, wasn't particularly familiar with prior to the pandemic, and that's force majeure. And unfortunately, through a number of contract disputes um, in various circumstances, this, they still give me a bit of a shiver. Um, you'd mentioned, Kieran, um, the foreseeability test there and maybe considering whether a pandemic would still be seen as a force majeure um, situation going forward. Maybe could you maybe talk us to that a little bit more and maybe whether you can foresee whether a pandemic or epidemic in the future would still be considered under that same clause. Thanks, Emma. Yeah, no, it's it, it, it's it's the short answer is it's extremely subjective. Um, and I think the point that sort of we're looking at is the fact that we've come through a pandemic, a global pandemic, and we've been obviously um, everyone's been particularly tested and and stretched, and yet we've become used to it, and we've worked the way through it. Businesses have worked their way through it. So the question is, when that um, when you've had that and you've had that um, uh, experience in the market, that it, whether it will be foreseeable or deemed as an unforeseeable event, um, is definitely there's definitely a question mark on that. I think the key thing will be for businesses to ensure that when they are looking at force majeure clauses that they really do define what is meant by pandemic um, so that um, that won't be um, potentially um, overarched by um, government regulations. Yeah. And it also in terms of the whole contract piece, like contracts exist. They're not just for big businesses. They're for business of all, all scales. And I suppose you get into a debate around the contract and you're, thinking around litigation, but it is a pretty costly process and time consuming. So can put additional pressures on the business that maybe they're not able to really cope with. Are there any other options available if say you want a, a quick a quick fix and avoid having to go through the court? Yeah, well, we, we, we are big advocates. Um, obviously, we're in the litigation department. We are big advocates of, of dispute resolution, Emma. So um, that's been thrown around more and more over the last couple of years as alternative dispute resolution. So your mediations and your arbitrations and the likes of adjudications, particularly in, in, in construction disputes. Um, that you know, the first thing that we say to parties that come in um, to us, if there's a, if they find themselves in, in a contractual dispute, is always can can you work it out? Can the, you find a resolution? What are the issues in dispute? And there's is there a middle ground? And I think that's the point we kind of tipped our cap to a little bit there during the presentation. Is you know, is there an opportunity for you to discuss or renegotiate or try and find um, a resolution? Um, mediation is really, um, we find particularly effective and we've, we're fortunate in having some great mediators over here um, in, in, in Northern Ireland. And um, certainly we try to promote that before you progress now through the litigation route. There are litigation remedies and so depending on the circumstances, you may have the likes of your um, emergency mandatory injunction, um, which might give you a relatively quick re re response. But again, that's your cost, your litigation cost, which we wouldn't be doing our job if we didn't try to manage clients on that and try to minimize those costs and avoid them for them. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, definitely the, your, your, your various avenues through dispute resolution are, um, are, are, are always there to be explored. And no doubt trying to manage the emotions along the way. Absolutely. <laughs> um, in terms of, so you're obviously you're obviously kept very busy in NL Good Body. Um, what are the kind of what what do you see in our local themes? You know, cases that are that are appearing in our own market just are certainly more prevalent. Yeah, 
interestingly, the themes that we have seen have been that that supply and the supply demand and 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 um, unable to meet obligations both on the end of the supplier and also on the other end of the recipient. And um, remarkably, what we found is the number of agreements that that businesses have entered into, which have particularly onerous clauses. Um, I suppose to to use the poker term, the larger entity is perhaps bullied the table somewhat. Um, and some of them don't even really have sufficient exit plans or, or termination clauses. There's no flexibility in them. So, um, you know, the, uh, often the, the reality has been quite um, uh, not from a supplier's perspective, not necessarily what they wanted to hear and that, you know, you really are going to struggle to get out of this. Um, and you're going to have to, you know, really look to reason with the other side or try to manage the expectations. Um, at the same time as we kind of look through the options today, if there is if there is a supply issue there, it simply can't be met. Um, and there are legitimate reasons for that. You, can you fall? Can you look to your force majeure? Can you look to um, can you look to your um, the arguments such as um, frustration um, or is it a remedy for damages? Um, we are finding that mix, but the thing that's really jumped out at us is that is that issue amongst suppliers and and the shape of some of the contracts that just seem to be particularly onerous. Yeah, so pl plenty to think about there as everyone uh, rallies to look at their, their contracts in the various places. I hope we haven't started a, a massive concern here. Um, uh, as litigators, it's doom and gloom sometimes, Emma, but at the same time, it is a good time for everybody to kind of reflect and and uh, and, and have a look at what um, what they're currently in, in, in the midst of contract-wise. Contract yeah, no, absolutely. Well, we've no more questions, so um, we will leave it at that. So thanks again to Kieran and Ali and all at NL Goodbody for their support for the society in terms of this series. Um, and um, again, if you want to rewatch the webinar or for anyone else that you want to share it with, the link will be available after this. So we will be taking a break for the summer. So hope everyone has um, some holidays planned, manages to get away, and um, we'll see you back again in the autumn time. Thank you.